This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. That it is Siobhan Scott, psychotherapist and author joining us. She's author of the book, The Minds of Mass Killers, Understanding and Interpreting the Pathway to Violence. Always a pleasure having you on here. Uh, Siobhan, let's talk daybells. Uh, lots of testimony over the last many a days. What's been standing out to you as a psychotherapist and an author of material relating to minds like this uh, that we've heard uh, over the last handful of days? You know, we got a chance to listen again to Colby's audio recording Mm -hmm. with Lori. And it's just so heartbreaking to listen to because Colby is not crazy. He's religious, but he's not crazy religious. Mm -hmm. And it's just shocking how Lori does seem to communicate love for him, affection for him, and yet is just so caught up in these batshit crazy delusions. You know, she doesn't get it. She doesn't get the pain that she's caused. She deceived him and continues to try to deceive him. And I I felt like his testimony and his, um, particularly that recorded phone call, was very, very powerful. And I can't help but think that that is going to really sway the jury. Is this a case where she has dug herself a hole so deep with everybody, including her children, that the only method of survival is to continue to lie and continue to uh, believe these delusions because coming back to the surface of reality is just far too painful. Is this, is this a survival mechanism that we're seeing at this point with her? I, I think to some degree that that totally fits. But I also think that with her interesting kind of delusional disorder, she likely still really believes it, you know, really does. And that's one of the other things that I got from the testimony with um, Melanie Gibb and Zulema Pastemis is how much these people believed it and how convincing Lori and Chad were. And as bizarre as (sighs) these beliefs sound, zombies, demons, portals, you know, castings, the stuff is just out of reality. But they really believed it. And, you know, we had wondered about that before. Is this just a way to manipulate people? But I think it's legit. I think they buy it. And it's so strange to have this combination of being this crazy, literally, along with the ability to maneuver, manipulate, and to combine elements of rationality to try to, you know, um, get around the police investigation. They are really quite a pair. And and it's fascinating to hear other people relay their observations and the way that they were sucked in. It also really struck me how Chad manipulates the vulnerable. And I think Lori just bought into that completely. But they told these women they were goddesses. You know, that seemed to be a term that he would use over and over and over. And for people who are fragile, who are suggestible, who may not, you know, be frankly all that intelligent and very needy, they're looking for a purpose in life. They're looking for a place to belong. He just worked them. And they were another bit of information that came out is they were actively trying to recruit into their group of 144,000. And one of Lori's friends that hadn't had contact with her since 2016, then had contact with her in 2019 when she was trying to recruit her. And she could see that Lori had really mentally deteriorated and was really crazy. And she didn't bite. And so Lori dropped it. Um, But I think they had this radar for the vulnerable and found them in these religious groups and just really, really sunk their teeth into them and pulled them in. Were you surprised at all by the amount of people that that went along with this? I mean, people that otherwise, you know, seemed, I guess, normal from what we can tell, uh, like Zulima and and her other friend, uh, Melanie Gibb. um, They're very religious. You can tell that you know that. But the ability that they had to consume what she was giving and process it and walk away going, yeah, that seems logical, like the kids being zombies and climbing on the walls and that these sort of things were legitimately happening uh, when they weren't around Lori. They, they said in many cases, for a time being, they did believe it. They don't anymore. 
but they were able to walk away. I, it's just, it's such an inconceivable thing to go to your friends and say these crazy things and for them yeah. to be like, oh, okay. Unless this is just something none of us, you know, do because we don't say these things to our friends. But I'm curious, like if somebody that you really trust, just started saying these things of belief, would, how easy is it for people to go along with things like this? It shows there's a percentage of the human population, and this is a very uncomfortable thing to realize, but there's a percentage of the human population who are in some ways functioning as adults, and in other ways, they're very childlike and very suggestible and can be convinced about just about anything if someone knows how to appeal to their emotions and to, you know, to, to build them up and make them feel important. And now you have the special knowledge, you're a goddess, you know, you've got these supernatural powers. It's really shocking to think that there are people who are that suggestible, but these are probably people, classic, classic folks who join cults. I don't think that's the majority of us. You know, yeah. thankfully, but you do find people like this and it's really scary how superficially normal they can appear. As I say, if we saw them as our neighbors, we'd smile, say hello and think that they're perfectly normal people. But in their thinking process, there's a lot wrong. Yeah, I, without a doubt. When we're, we're looking early on at the relationship with Chad and Lori, uh, it I mean, it looks like it was very intense from the get go. And anybody who has experience with different type of personalities, maybe disorders, maybe has read a little bit about it, uh, you'd be familiar with the term love bombing. Is mm -hmm. that kind of what we saw going on there with Chad to Lori right out of the gate? I mean, I'm speaking of the, uh, the, the love letter text uh, romance novel, you know, that contained words like loin fire. <laughs> Things of that nature. <laughs> yeah, thinking, oh, she'll really dig loin fire. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like love bombing to a crazy extreme. Oh, what a creative writer, huh? Oh. What a creative writer. Yeah. Really bad poetry, but but uh, he, I think, yes, you could say Chad was a master love bomber. And he applied this probably in many relationships with, with needy people. He really seemed to to hone in on vulnerability and just lay it on thick. And at what point in his life did he learn to do this? You know, has he always been this way? It sure sounds like something that he weaponized and it, it worked for him. It very, very much does. What was your take on uh, how Lori reacts? And we talked just briefly about this earlier, where she had that other friend she was trying to recruit, suggesting you know, you can leave your children who I believe were like three and like 11 mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like you've done your part for them already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they're mm -hmm. children uh, and asking her to leave and come along with them. And, and Lori seeming to know when to shut it down. She seemed to have a, a level of control as to know when yes. to be talking about yes. crazy land and when yeah. not to, especially too with interrogations and such. She wasn't talking about zombies to the police, but she was with her friends at that same time window. Exactly, exactly. And this is that interesting component of rationality where, you know, on some level, she had this dual reality of believing this completely crazy stuff that's absolutely impossible. But on the other hand, being able to read the room and to tell, okay, when am I, you know, influencing this person and when do I need to back off? When is it not going to work? And as we talk about psychotic people, this is generally not the combination that you see, mm -hmm. but it does happen. And, and they make a fascinating case study because of that. Um, it's, it's just so fascinating. The, the other thing that, um, was interesting to me, I went back and reviewed an interview with Adam Cox, who was the older brother who was not mentally ill and yeah. is not mentally ill. And he's the one that continued a relationship with Charles Vallow. And I can only imagine the heartbreak and level of anxiety and distress that Charles Vallow was experiencing as he tried to contact the family. And he tried to say, this is out of control. This is scary. This is dangerous. And as Adam said, the family went along with Lori. Mm. So you've got this family system. And he said, even though the parents said, well, she's out of reality right now, but she's not hurting anyone. So leave her alone. And, you know, this kind of validation, when people aren't calling you out on this, yeah. 
it just strengthens what you're doing and it strengthens the belief. So really it goes back to, you know, the family, these are not well people either. And there was one brother who was trying to, to, you know, confront and say, this is not okay. There's a lot of bizarre deaths with that family, even beyond the world of the the Daybell case. <laughs> it's yes. like people have died in bizarre situations. Uh, I know one of her brothers, um, the, the one who is in radio still is, um, and I, I won't say his name because I know this. what happened with him and his involvement with a death I don't think was truly intentional, but uh, in one of his radio bits years ago, uh, ended up having a contestant die on the air. Uh, oh. have, you, have you heard of this part of it? I have not heard of well, this Welcome one. to this new uh, level on the uh, tree of uh, the Coxes. Um, it was a contest called Hold Your Wii for a Wii. This is when oh. Nintendo Wiis were very uh, in demand, yeah. like a little over, yeah. uh, like 15 years ago. Um, and there's a condition you can have if you drink too much uh, water, you can drown yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, wow. the, the woman in the studio went into some sort of shock, died uh, on the air with winning, trying to win wow. this Wii. Uh, and it was a horrible thing at the time. And I was working in radio. I remember when this happened. And then it was a big reevaluation of what kind of, you know, contest can we and cannot do where something mm -hmm. like this could go horribly wrong, which it did. But I just found it ironic that there's death over there, too. Uh, it, it's just, it's like there's a dark cloud surrounding this family in certain ways. Yeah, I, I think, you know, if we were to really look deeply into all of them, um, you would find some strange stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and, and maybe not completely delusional, psychotic like Lori, but there's a lot that's not quite right. And the more that we hear from other people and the, the all the deaths, yeah. you know, it really is a red flag that this is a group that is not well put together. Yeah, without a doubt. This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruski. Simone Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Psychotherapist and author. Check out her book, The Minds of Mass Killers, Understanding and Interpreting the Pathway to Violence. My name's Tony Bruski. You can follow me on Twitter at Tony B Pod. Stay with us.